Sam Cedar on the Majority Report. It is such a pleasure for me to welcome our next guest back to the program, ladies and gentlemen, reporter, uh, writer for Rolling Stone magazine, author of now, um, is this a fourth book? Third, third book. Third, third book. Third book. Uh, it is Arms and the Dudes, How Three Stoners from Miami Beach Became the Most Unlikely Gun Runners in History. We have the link at majority.fm. Uh, you're going to want to buy this book right now. Pre-order it. Guy Lawson. Hello, Guy. Hey, Sam. How you doing? I'm doing great. Thank you uh, so much for joining us. I'm very excited about this. I'm definitely, I think, I feel like I'm more excited than you are uh, <laughs> about the release of this book because... I've heard about this story for so long, um, and I don't have any of the anxiety of the performance of how is my book going to do? How is it going to be received? I'm just excited to um, uh, to read this thing. Um, and um, now let's let's talk a little bit about the story. And I want to get a sense of where the story went from where you first, because this is based on a uh, uh, a piece that you wrote in Rolling Stone. I think in like a 2009. No, no, 2011. 2011. All right, so tell us the basics of these, these, they were basically kids almost, right, when they started this. Yeah, in 2008, a newspaper story in the New York Times appeared on the front page describing the scandal of these sleazy kids from Miami Beach who had won a contract to provide ammunition to the Afghan National Army via the Pentagon for 300 million bucks, and then they proceeded to ship uh, faulty um, bad, uh, misfiring, basically crap ammo to the Afghans. And the New York Times story, you know, revealed them to be like, you know, one guy was a masseuse, the other guy was, a, you know, had a checkered history of, you know, with, with his girlfriends and domestic violence. And it essentially said that the Pentagon had been negligent in its procurement policies and had been fooled by these kids into ship into buying uh, bad quality ammunition. So I read that piece like everybody else. The difference is, is that I actually wanted to find out what was behind the headlines. And so I bided my time and waited for the right moment and went and approached the, 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 the dudes, as they, I came to know them, um, and wrote a story for Rolling Stone with one of the dudes talking to me at the time. And that story showed that, number one, that they were not just these cartoon characters that the New York Times had, had portrayed them, but they were actually really interesting, smart and adept kids who'd mastered this online bidding process that the Pentagon had invented uh, in the two th in, in the mid aughts in the wake of the no bid procurement contract scandals that people might remember with Blackwater and Halliburton and all the the Cheney war profiteering stuff that sort of shamed the the government into making public um, these these arms and uh, different defense contracts open to public bidding. And so the story ran in Rolling Stone, and and it was kind of like a, a slice of life piece, really, I suppose you'd say. A kind of a trip into a, you know, an insane world these kids had traveled into, where you know there's Albanian gangsters, Swiss gun runners, and all this kind of, you know, what you the stuff that happened during the Bush administration that you still can't believe actually happened, you know, it's it's that that was such a blur, you know, like the mission accomplished moment, you know, the 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 tortures in Abu Ghraib, the all that swirl of stuff after 9/11, and this just seemed to be somehow to capture a piece of that and, and it, the, the, the article got a lot of attention and it, and it got a, a, a movie contract um, with Warner Brothers with Todd Phillips the guy from The Hangover and they're actually shooting the movie now so there was that kind of like pop culture thing that happened around the story but what really intrigued me about it was something much deeper and more interesting to me was the underlying policy of it what was really going on was the Pentagon really fooled by these kids was was it so simple as that did the New York Times get the story right and not to be like too meta about it, but it just struck me as implausible that two, you know, stoner kids could fool the government. And so what had happened in the case, as is almost every federal case these days, is the, the, the dudes had pled guilty because fighting the federal government is virtually impossible. Once you've been charged by the federal government, you're essentially convicted unless you're willing to spend like on the order of a million bucks to fight them because they have limitless resources. And, and especially in public cases like this, they'll do anything anything, literally anything, to, to silence uh, any kind of criticism or doubt cast on the government's authority and propriety. So what had happened in this case, they pled guilty and, they'd, and, they, and the federal judge had put a whole bunch of documents under seal. And so I, I kind of just bided my time and worked my sources and, and eventually found a way to get to those documents 
And, and by then I had a book deal and I was really determined to, to report the underlying story. And what I found was pretty amazing to me. You know, it's like the fact, number one, that this has never been reported anywhere. And number two, that it's as comprehensive and as um, profound as I discovered, which is essentially this. And, and if, you, if you think of it instrumentally, it makes perfect sense. What happened is the United States government invaded Iraq, or sorry, Afghanistan and then Iraq. You know, they, 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 thought they, they basically with no thought for the aftermath. And then they discovered, you know, promptly that they're, afterwards that there are sectarian and societal uh, divisions that, that people don't really enjoy being occupied. Societies are not really that into it. And, and so they face these insurgencies. And so the only way to really put down the insurgency is, you know, number one, have a draft in the United States and put every, you know, war age eligible college student and, and, you know, worker into these distant Muslim countries and lose the next election and every election for the next hundred years. Right. Or... Or, you know, stand up these, as they came to the term, you know, stand up uh, these arm, armies in these countries in Afghanistan and Iraq. And so in order to do that, you can, one, you know, provide them with the same material, if that is to say guns and tanks and things the United States government uses, which is expensive and dangerous because they could be turned against you. Uh, read two, ISIS uh, coming no, out. Well, no, that, that, that right. ISIS is number two. Or you can pour in a whole buttload, excuse my language, a whole, you know, ocean of Soviet style, Soviet bloc ammunition and weaponry, which is what the United States government did. So where do you get that? Where do you get no, all that? Wait those a second. No, wait a second. Let's uh, uh, let's stop here because there's a there's a couple of things about this that I, that I find the, the, about your story that I find really fascinating, and and I, I want to break some of this stuff out because when we say the U.S. government, right, like. Yeah. We're really talking about a bunch of different sort of, it seems to me, and, and this is what I find fascinating about your story, too, is that there's sort of these different, almost, I don't want to say fiefdoms, but, uh, but the, the, everything is not necessarily moving in cohesion. Yeah, and, no, it's not, it's not monolithic at all. And, and so we have, um, we have orders that come down from on high that one could reasonably predict will lead to one to two or three different outcomes, right? And sort of the middle management then makes these decisions based on this. So the idea is like, it, we know we don't want to give them uh, U.S. made weapons because at the end of the day, we don't want to be fighting against those, right? right. And and that's, and to a certain extent, that's, there is some, I guess, um, there is some, I guess, uh, broad agreement within the government, right, between the civilian leadership and the military leadership. Yeah, it makes sense. And so, and so that leaves, <clears throat> essentially there's two kinds of munitions in the world. There's standard or Western munitions and non-standard or Soviet bloc munitions. And so if you're going to get Soviet bloc munitions, the natural place to get them, there's two places to get that kind of weaponry. One is Russia and the other is China. But you have to remember that, that America wasn't just triumphal after, you know, 2004, 2005, after Bush was reelected. It was, like, to the point of delusion, triumphal. And so the United States government, and again, this is the high-level stuff that you're talking about, not the middle management, the high level of government decided to ban any weapons purchases from Russia or China. So you need a whole load of this stuff, but you can't buy it from the place, really the only place you can effectively buy it. And so that means, by reduction, that you have to go to Balkan gun runners. You have to go to the same, you know, Serbian and Croatian and Bulgarian and Albanian munitions companies that are supplying weapons to, you know, Charles Taylor in Liberia, to, uh, you know, to Paul Kagame in Rwanda to arm the, you know, the Congolese rebels. It's like on and on it goes. So you're dealing with basically gun runners. So that's the decision from above. Now, I'm not suggesting that George Bush would have a clue of the consequences that he was of his decisions, or Dick Cheney, they were just ideological and political decisions, and then it's up to middle management to implement them. And that is a nightmare, right? Like, how are we going to do that? We're going to send a bunch of soldiers to, to, you know, to, to Serbia to buy 500 million rounds of AK-47 ammunition? How's that going to work out? Do you think they'll get corrupted? You know? right. Do you think it'll be a scandal? So what the middle management decided to do was to use middlemen, essentially, and that's where the dudes come in. Right. They want to outsource this so that they're at arm's length from it. There is some measure of plausible deniability down the road. Private contractors. Who, you know, who takes care of diplomats and shoots civilians in, in Baghdad? Right. 
You know, how you gonna, nobody ever gets charged criminally for that stuff inside the government because it's not them. It's private contractors. It's just, it's plausible deniability on a geopolitical level. Okay, so, um, so, so, the, and, and this also sort of, I guess, coincides with the idea of an open bid process, but it's just a question of like, you know, put it up there on the website and some guy who's in charge of like, you know, the webmaster, the guy who's supposed to be like, oh, I do content management for uh, the government procurement site. Um, <laughs> that guy is told by his boss at the Pentagon, hey, don't be too, don't get too picky about this. It's even better than that. It's, uh, you know, not to be sexist, but it's not a webmaster. It's a web mistress or a bunch of them, actually. And they're these, you know, the dudes discovered that the people administrating this contract were a bunch of matronly nice civilian women living in Rock Island, Illinois, right? <laughs> and they're, and they're administering contracts for, to supply weapons to Afghanistan. And they have nobody on the ground in, in Kabul to monitor the quality or to, to oversee to make sure that the quantity that comes in is, is monitored. So essentially, you've got these nice soccer moms or grannies is more like how they described it to me, the, the dudes, these grannies administrating this fantastically important contract with no ability to, number one, really manage it, or number two, to even to, 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 to understand who they're doing business with. Like, you know, for example, this stuff is done online. So the, the, the dudes just started bidding. I mean, they, they bid on Iraq contracts and won a whole bunch, but this Afghanistan thing was a, was a whole sort of another level of This beast. is the and largest small arms deal in the history of the United States. Correct. And it, it's being... And it was, I don't know if the readers have heard, the listeners have know this, but they're like one, one, the kids that won it were like 21 and 25, wake and bake stoners. I mean, no joke. Uh, wake and bake stoners who were just extremely good at bidding online, like, like hackers or something, or guys, you know, like a, a website designers or something. Right, guys who just knew how to like, oh, uh, I could either be uh, juicing Dig at this time to get more hits on my YouTube, or I could be juicing this um, government uh, procurement process and make a multi-million dollar deal for small arms in Afghanistan. Yeah, I mean, the, the insight is if you, if you go to FBO, Federal Business Opportunities, you'll look, you'll parse through and you just start seeing these contracts that are posted. And it's everything from like tanks to napkins and toilet seats, the proverbial kind of things. And uh, it looks really boring. It just looks like, you know, filling out a driver's license form or something. But to the kids, those contracts were like the, you know, like the land of Oz. The streets were paved with gold. It's just the most beautiful documents ever. And it's fascinating, too, I think, one element of this is that they were Orthodox Jewish kids, these guys. And so they'd grown up reading the Talmud and all the kind of legalistic and, and multilingual and legal jargon associated with, with Orthodox Judaism. And so these, doc, these, these, these online contracts were you know, easy compared to that. So these guys get on there. They, they do this pro procurement. They, not only is there no oversight for the deal that they're making, but there's also, there's also, is it, is there a guy behind these uh, grannies essentially saying like, oh, this is good. These guys are going to get these weapons and uh, uh, granny, I don't want you to get too scrutinizing on this or, or how does it happen? Like how much is just sort of passive and how much is active? Oh, it's very active. And here, here's the thing though, it's, it's, it's sort of, it's both. It's like passive aggressive or something like that. See, on one hand, you have like the you know the people inside the Pentagon realize when they when they understand that their options are basically few, that they have no choice but to use these private contractors to buy weapons from Balkans gun runners, that they're they're guaranteed to be breaking the law, right? Like you just can't do business with these people without bribes and corruption and sexual favors. It's just that's just not how the world works. And so what they do, it's an amazing feat. The Pentagon begins the regulation to, to, to cover this area with the phrase, notwithstanding any other provision of law. And what they take that to mean is any other provision of law, including the Constitution, international treaties, any other provision of law does not apply to this. So this is the sole legal regime, and there's nobody overseeing it. There's no congressional hearings. There's no press accounts of this. Nothing is ever said or done about this. It just is a reality. Kind of like a victimless crime, I guess you'd say, except until it gets revealed. And so on one level, they have this kind of, we're free to break the law, 
And then on the other hand, they have this, but we're really going to enforce the law on these contractors. So it's just like a weird paradox where there's no responsibility inside government, but these contractors are put in peril. And that's kind of where the dudes, you know, wander in with, you know, with their, with their bong, <laughs> blowing smoke from their bong and having no idea that there's this much bigger thing that's going on around them. So to a certain extent, the, 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 the premium, I guess, associated with this in terms of the money uh, is um, we're not just paying you to, to get these guns uh, here. Uh, we're, we're paying you to, to assume all risk, essentially. Right, exactly uh, right. Exactly right. I mean, it's sort of like, you know, it's like writing a sitcom. The actual writing of a sitcom, not as difficult as the notes you take from the executives. And that's what they're <laughs> paying you for, is uh, we're going to give you thousands of dollars uh, just to hear our notes. And this is essentially the s- same dynamic. So these guys, they, they, they basically buy, arrange to buy the weapons in Bulgaria, right? And get Roman them in Albania. In Albania. And well, get, all over, actually, all over. And so, so what goes, well, everything goes awry. Right. Yeah. I mean, 28 people die. You know, it's, 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 it, what, what happens is essentially these kids have uh, started small with the Iraq contract, so they're winning contracts for like 1,000 AK-47 rifles or guns or, you know, 2,000 helmets. And they're shipping them to Baghdad, and they're, they're acquiring what's called past performance, which is to show that you, know, that you, you have the record of performance with the government. And so when the Afghanistan contract gets posted, it's, you know, it's not for a 1,000. It's for a 100 million of things. You know? It's for you know, hundreds and hundreds of aircrafts filled with, with munitions, basically enough to, to create the Afghan National Army from scratch. And... Uh, and they, you know, they're up against Fortune 500 companies, and there's also other small bidders on it as well. But they, they, these kids have no overhead, essentially. You know, they're more or less working from their apartments with a cell phone and internet connection. That's it. Whole bunch of weed, and so they have, you know, and they have no kind of a fear either. You know, they have no compunction, and so they just bid a really low price, and the government vets them, and nobody in the government stops to think, well, how old are these guys? For a couple of reasons, but one of which is that they have an older partner, a financier, this guy in his 50s, a Mormon guy from Utah, of who course. sort of makes him look more legit. And then just Diveroli, this guy, the leader of the gang, from Diveroli, is just, you know, I, I, it's hard to emphasize this enough. And I, he just got out of prison quite recently, and I haven't talked to him since he got out. But um, it's hard to sort of emphasize enough just how brilliant he is, uh, you know, just in terms of thinking, sleeping, eating, business, just a nonstop, you know, if he was in any other industry, you would have heard of him by now anyway. You know, if he was, <laughs> if he was a car salesman, he'd be the best car salesman in America. If he was, you know, in internet business, he'd be like Mark, you know, uh, what's his name, Zuckerberg. He's just a, a very um, talented individual and, so, and, and determined. And so no one ever sort of thought to say, well, they look really young. And what do you mean that they, you know, really? We're going to give this contract to them? And so... They won but this the isn't just an incompetence, right? I mean, it's like a willful incompetence. Like, it doesn't matter who they are as long as they do this. It doesn't matter who they are as long as that bureaucrat has done its jo- their job. Right. And that goes all the way along the line, right? So each ticking these boxes along the way is how you wind up with disaster. No one ever takes responsibility. No one ever says, whoa, wait, what are we doing here? Right. There's no sort of general officer assigned to procurement. Procurement is seen as a backwater inside the Pentagon. But kind of more importantly, I think, if you look at like the scandals of the last you know, 10 years, the, the sort of some of the main scandals like torture, for example, or NSA uh, um, uh, illegal uh, surveillance, you know, who, are the, who are the poster boys for that, killing it in civilians? So you've got, for torture, you've got Lind- Lindy English, right. you know, some yeah. guard. For the NSA, it's supposed to be all Edward Snowden's fault. Right. Right? For, for killing civilians, it was Chelsea uh, Manning who was sort of the reason that that's bad. When, right. in fact, those, those things are just patently untrue. And so the most dangerous thing to be in an age of such irresponsibility is to be young and defenseless. That's right. who gets run over. Not these bureaucrats who didn't take responsibility, who didn't do the scrutiny, who broke the law. They never get... In trouble. Well, the dynamic with with torture in particular is also, it seems to me, uh, very apropos because 
as far as I can tell, the way that torture um, became essentially policy on the ground was a sort of a an ambiguity that started it uh, uh, on the top, right? There was exactly. no active like you're going to go torture. It was we're just going to relax the rules that prevented torture in the past. And right. that's going to send a signal, and as it reverberates outward like ripples in a pond, it's going to get broader, and it's going to mean more things. Exactly, and, and the bureaucrats are going to understand, you know, what the imperative is, how to get ahead. And so, you know, so, so that you don't get ahead by being a stickler for detail about these weapons deals. You don't get ahead by insisting that the quality be good. And slowing things down. You don't get ahead by saying, whoa, 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 this, that guy that we're buying, actually buying the guns from is an illegal gun runner. Right. You get fired, demoted, you know, pushed aside. So it's this idea that there's somehow like the greater mission and the greater good is, you know, it's basically lawlessness. All right. So, uh, I mean, we, you and I have talked a little bit about the story in the past on this program, and people should read the book because there's a tremendous amount of, of intrigue in it. It's a crazy story. And I want to ask you sort of a, uh, a meta question about, because uh, I don't know if people remember, I hope they do, that um, uh, we've, you've been on the program to talk about Octopus, which is... yeah. Also, uh, the story of Sam Israel, uh, th and uh, I think it was the subtitle was uh, Wall Street's Wildest Con, um, yeah. and, which was also just an insane story. And, uh, but before we get there, and I want to yeah. just sort of like, uh, you know, ask you one of those sort of meta author questions. But I also know that there was, and I don't know how much you can talk about this, but like you started in telling us the story, the, the story was initially reported in, in the New York Times. And I remember, like, even at the time that Josh Marshall was really intrigued by that. So I saw it on TPM quite a bit. I think it was just sort of picking up from that uh, New York Times story. And then it just all went away because it was these TPM, kids. TPM's running an extract next week, which is awesome. Oh, okay. That's great. And I remember him his interest in this story. But um, you, your reporting didn't just sort of flesh out what the New York Times did. It contradicted it, didn't it? And, and, and Flat that, out. There was some, Flat out. All right, tell us what you can about the sort of, because it, it created a little bit of conflict between you and the New York Times. Yeah. Uh, you know, I, I, I have, you know, I, I think like any sensible human being, I have a bit of ambivalent feelings about the New York Times. I love the newspaper. I read it daily, but I also have some critical feelings towards it. And for good reason, I think, when you look back, especially over since post 9-11 and, some of the way that things have been covered, especially things that, that are contrary to the, the mainstream narrative or contrary to powerful forces. Um, so what, what, in, the, in the story that in the New York Times, these kids were portrayed basically as sleazebags and that they would do anything for money and the government had been negligent and essentially been fooled by them and it had endangered these Afghan soldiers by supplying them with substandard ammunition and weaponry. And that sort of sounds like, you know, wow, that's a cool story. What a, bad, what a pair of bad kids or what three bad kids and they should go to prison and they should be federally convicted and all that stuff. <clears throat> but what I discovered <clears throat> excuse me, is basically the opposite of that. That the United States government decided to deliberately to buy as much cheap, nasty uh, ammunition as it possibly could, as quickly as it could, down and dirty, and it needed some, somebody to go out and do that for them. And that what, what the New York Times had discovered was not faulty ammunition. It was just exactly what the Pentagon had, uh, had demanded, which is you know, cheap, nasty ammunition. And it was so misleading that, for example... And let me, just, me, let me just clarify what that distinction is. It's huge, right? If it's you epic. buy cheap, nasty ammunition, you know it is a certain percentage of it is going to fail, right? Like, that's, well, that's not, what that's that going to fail. It just it reveals what you... You know, the... the, the, the uh, what the mission is, right? So the mission is not like, let's get the Afghan army going. It's like, let's get the Afghan army going on the cheap and so that we don't have any repercussions down the road. And all these things can make a certain amount of sense, but that's the reality, right? So, so the kids were operating in a world where agendas were blended and, and hidden. Um, and so the New York Times runs this story, and on the front page of the New York Times, there's this photograph of this jumble of AK-47 and different caliber small 
uh, a small weapon ammunition. And the story really revolves around 100 million rounds of AK-47 ammunition that was manufactured in China in the 1950s, most of it, and then shipped to Albania, because Albania was at the time China's only ally in Europe or the world, really, and uh, stored in these caves for decades. And so the implication was, and the story strongly was, that the ammunition, the bad, greasy, miscolored ammunition on, in the front page of the New York Times was a sample of this Albanian ammunition, and it just wasn't. It just straight up was not. And so the New York Times created this impression. They, they ran, uh, in the article, they ran the mug shots of, the, of two of the kids, David Packhouse and Ephraim Diveroli. They hadn't even been charged with anything. Those were mug shots from years earlier in a different encounter, a minor thing. But, you know, they, the New York Times doesn't run mug shots of people who haven't been charged with anything. Right. Unless they're trying to frame them up, make them look a certain way. And so that's what happened. The kids looked like these sleazy, you know, um, uh, fraudsters. And so, you know, in my view, and I don't think this was done with any malice or anything, I just I think that, that the New York Times got it wrong because, number one, I think it's, it's very... It's not a natural thing. It has not been for some time now, and I hope it's coming back into fashion, to question the really powerful. When you practice a certain kind of access journalism, you don't go around saying things that will stop you getting access. It will stop you getting datelines from you know, ships at sea with the Navy or front line with the, you know, with the Marines. And, uh, and so, you know, and I, you know, honestly, I'm not, I don't practice that kind of journalism. And I, and I, you know, I've been denounced by the FBI. I've been, you know, like, every, you know I, I don't say I burn bridges on purpose, but I, I don't even care about bridges. I just want to tell the truth as much as I can. Well, you've been now, you've you've been denounced many times in my household. Uh, you well, know, there you go, for, by but, Saul. For yeah, many uh, for for, <laughs> for a multitude of reasons, not the least of which uh, your heavy-handed pouring of gin. Uh, but aside from that, but but I mean, so I mean, this is a, a classic case of the of of basically um, of of stenography on some level, right? Where it's not. Well, no, I mean, look, look, the reporter. His name's Chris Chivers. He's an amazing reporter, right? He's like one of the best war correspondents of this generation. I have great respect for him. I just differ on the facts that I found, and so you know, it's also unfair because I'm like spending eighteen months on this, right. and he's spending eighteen weeks or six, whatever, three months. So you know, it's uh, there's a second guessy nature to it, and and I, and I want to emphasize that I try in the book to be very fair about this because I, I don't want people thinking that I'm, you know, holding myself high and mighty, or that I think that the story was obviously there. It, it wasn't necessarily, but what I'm saying is, is the mindset of questioning, you know, sources and and wondering about like what could be actually going on here instead of what sort of apparently is going on. Uh, is there, and I think it's indicative of like a much bigger story to do with oversight of government in general. And look, it wasn't just that the journalists, I mean, it wasn't just the New York Times. No journalist covered this scandal. This scandal is ongoing for years. It's ongoing now. What do you think is happening in ISIS to the, you know, to the Syrian freedom fighters? Where are they getting their weapons? They're getting them from the Balkans. Right. And how are they doing that? They're doing that because they're being facilitated by gun runners and using, and this is something I document in the book, you know, using the same people that the dudes were dealing with and now selling to the United States government indirectly, you know, they, they sell to the Iraqi government and how, where those monies come from and all that stuff. But they're basically proliferating small weapons into these war zones in massive amounts with no oversight from anybody. And I mean Congress, the New York Times, anybody. It's astounding. Is there, is this, I mean, is this a function of... Is it a fun? I mean, because look, I mean, obviously, the right this this is this is not the weapons industry per se coming in lobbying the government, right? Because it's ostensibly not people. I mean, it's people sort of like in sort of more gray areas who are are, are profiting the most out of this. Is this just like? I mean. How much of this is there's some type of grand design, and how much of it is it's just sort of like a patchwork of, of, of poor policy decisions? You know, I, I think that it's um, a combination. I, you know, I think that the patchwork is really you know, self-evident. You see the decisions getting made. So President Obama is like, you know, okay, well, we'll do a little bit in Syria, but not all the way, and what's the right move here, and what are we going to do in Iraq and Afghanistan, all this kind of ambivalence about what really constitutes, you know, war anymore or victory. So, you know, that leads to a lot of confusion, a lot of, you know, improvised decision-making. 
But, you know, if, if, uh, underneath it all, or the, the grand design, I don't think it's a design. I think it's a lack of a design. And, and I think that, more or less, nobody in government wants to be accountable legally, but also nobody in government wants to be, like, to blame if something goes wrong. Right. Something big. And so that attitude is just, it's like a, it's like a nuclear uh, mushroom. It's just, like, over D.C. It's like this, it's like this bomb went off. And everybody, everybody is just li- inhaling this, this poison of, you know, just do whatever you can. The government, you know, is never responsible. We just, just hide, hide. I don't know. I don't quite what it is, but it feels like cowardice to me. Like everyone's afraid, afraid, afraid. You know, I mean, I got to say too, though. I mean, it, it, you know, when you describe that sort of um, that that dynamic. It just makes me think of the radio guys who came over from Clear Channel. Like, I mean, I, like that to me sounds like the uh, what we also consider to be sort of the corporate uh, ethos, I guess, which is like make sure at the end of the day when the music stops, you're not the one standing without the chair. Like, yeah. So here's here's an important element that I haven't talked to about this story. It's just really really vital to understand what happened. United States government in its all its myriad form, forms, you know, decides to buy these, this ammunition for the Afghans to try to turn the war around. And so in order to do that, they create these legal loopholes, legal loopholes and they empower these bureaucrats to give contracts to these small, con, you know, these small businesses like the dudes, who then go out and basically, you know, buy prostitutes for Albanian gunrunners or take prostitutes from Albanians and Swiss gunrunners. They just do all the dirty work, okay? At the same time, and this is, I think I hinted at this earlier, at the same time, the Pentagon's own criminal investigators get wind from a rival of the dudes that they're selling, that they're shipping this Chinese ammunition or some version of that rumor, and they begin an investigation. And what happens is there's this bitter struggle between the army in Afghanistan, the United States Army, who knows that the Afghans are running out of ammunition to continue the shipments, even though the stuff is 30, 40 years old, it still works. And the Pentagon's investigated to try to stop it because it's quote unquote Chinese. And the net result of that is is that the Afghans they, they stop the contract, the, 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 the legal investigators win that fight, and the Afghans run out of ammunition in the middle of the war. And this is two thousand eight, the start of the Friday season of two thousand eight, when essentially the war was lost. And guess how many people were held responsible for that? Hmm. None. And guess how much that played in the New York Times? Not at all. You know, like, so it's, it, it, it is just like this, it's like a, a, a kind of, it's, it's almost like the policy of the government is, is about protecting itself. I, I, in Citizen Four, Edward Snowden made a remark, which I thought was really, like, profound, but not, not simply because of, of the NSA, but for larger reasons, which is, you know, there are two classes of people in this country. There's the ruled and the rulers. And the rulers aren't just congressmen and senators, they're also bureaucrats. You know, they're federal prosecutors. They're investigators that can, that can uh, uh, um, I'm just going to whack a wasp here. Oh, shit. They're, they're investigators that can, uh, uh, that can launch cases with completely disastrous strategic consequences and never, ever, ever be held accountable. In fact, get promoted because it's perceived that they made this fantastic case that, that, that got these, two, these kids convicted that embarrassed the government on the front page of the New York Times. Right. There's a guy in prison right now for this stuff. It's not like I'm making it up. You know, these, if you read the book, you'll see it's very deeply reported. Just the question I have for the world and for your listeners is, you know, they're making a Hollywood movie out of this. You haven't talked about that, right, Sam? No, we had, uh, I, it's, uh, it, it, it sounds like it's going to be actually sort of funny. I mean, it sounds like, I mean, yeah. uh, I mean it's, it's a hangover guy. Right. So, you know, it's, you know, as much as I hope the movie succeeds and it's got great actors in it, a guy named Jonah Hill and Miles Teller and another huge star, which I don't think I can talk about, but it's, it's got all this excitement around it. We took, I took my... Uh, let me what? just cut the suspense. It's not me, folks. <laughs> I lobbied. I lobbied. <laughs> you, were, you were too busy with your cop role. I on know, the, I know, I know. You, you're you're able to get show. a conflict. Yes. But, but anyway, they're, they're making a movie, and I've read the script, and I've been on the set, and... 
believe me, they're not addressing these policy issues. Right, and that's to be expected. I mean, and, and hopefully what will happen is people will see the movie and, and, and read the book at that point. But let me ask you I a question. I would like it the other way around. I'd like people to read the book. Well, it yes. comes out next Tuesday. Pre-order now on Amazon.com or at your local independent store. Look, let me, let me uh, I, I want to move to the to the meta question and because, I mean, it, it, you know, when you talk about the, that dynamic, uh, of sort of the self-licking ice cream cone. I mean, that's sort of what um, what we saw with the Thomas Drake case. Here's a guy who's just sort of basically blowing the whistle on on a uh, NSA program that was gonna was just a boondoggle, uh, so much of a boondoggle that Congress ended up shutting it down. But he was uh, persecuted, almost prosecuted, uh, driven out of the government, uh, because he was blowing the whistle on basically on incompetence. All right. Let me, let me read this comment from an IM. And then I want to ask you this meta question because this, sure. this is what occurs to me. Uh, Ronald Reagan on the IM says, Sam, you interviewed Guy in 2012 about his book, Octopus. I went out and bought the book, burned through it in like three days. It was amazing. I've been looking forward to Dude since he first teased the book on your show way back then. Keep having him on. He's a great author and one of your best reoccurring guests. I agree with all of that. Let me ask you this about these two stories at the very least, because the the similarity to them, uh, to me, seems to be you have a broader system. In Octopus, it was Wall Street and people looking to make money and what they were willing to sort of overlook (laughs) Um, and <laughs> unquestioned uh, if they thought they were getting money. And, um, and in this, it's almost a similar uh, situation where, like, you had these sort of this crazy story of these individuals who were caught up in a crazier sort of broader system. Uh, yeah. And ultimately, they end up paying the price um, in, in both instances. I mean, what is it? How do you decide like what you're going to pursue in terms of a story? What are you looking for? You know, I don't know. I mean, does it choose me? Do I choose it? I, you know, I don't know. I mean, the thing that the, the, the couple things that these those two books have really deeply in common, uh, I think, are that first and foremost, the, the protagonists do not agree with the general assumption about how to conduct oneself in on Wall Street or in arms dealing. Mm. You know, they just don't buy the system. And in not buying the system, they don't respect the rules. And by not respecting the rules, they become criminals, of course. But I think what more, much more fascinating to me is, is that they reveal the system for what it really is. You know, Sam Israel, in his fraud, made Greenwich, Connecticut look like what it largely is, a bunch of pretentious fools. You know, hedge funds are essentially, you know, belief systems. Capitalism is a belief system. People think that the Federal Reserve is some permanent established thing. It's like less than a century old. It, it, you know, it, it requires you to believe that, um, that there's no gold standard, so that money is worth what it is because I say so. I, the Federal Reserve, say so. And Sam, you know, just was questioning things at their root. And I think likewise, these dudes were seeing the Pentagon in this, you know, enormous edifice of defense procurement. I mean, can you think of any like larger industry in the world? There is none. No. That was one of their insights, right? The biggest customer in the world is the Pentagon, so why don't you just like serve the Pentagon? Instead of trying to get lots of customers, just have one. But what they did was they saw all these generals and all these you know, preening David Petraeus, chest, puffed out chest people, as just another patsy, another, another way to, to make some dough. And when you think about it in those terms, I think that both Sam Israel and, and Octopus and, and the dudes and Arms and the Dudes are, you know, and I think that's why they're comical in a certain sense too, dramatic, darkly comical, is that they're not accepting, you know, the received wisdom of the American uh, uh, century or the, you know, the triumphalism, like the Dick Cheney. Is Dick Cheney like a really smart, capable guy or is he a buffoon? I know what I think. Right. You know, and he was the vice president of the United States and he's, he remains like this revered figure. And I look at him and I think he's a joke. So, you know, that, that's kind of the mindset, you know, I think that these, these two books have in common. And so, yeah, I mean, I guess I'm attracted to stories of people who, uh, who you know, been like, you know, myself a little bit, but just don't want to eat the, the drink, the Kool-Aid. That's fascinating. Um, and, uh, I mean, yeah, I mean, it's, it's, 
Octopus is a fantastic read. I am so excited about uh, reading uh, The Arms and the Dudes, and it occurs to me that I don't know why I didn't get a galley. Um, you, I sent you one. No, you didn't. They didn't send you one? No. You promised. You definitely promised. It didn't get there, really? Truly? Truly. You're the second person to say that. Rolling Stone told me the same thing yesterday. <sighs> Those bastards. Isn't that hunky-dory? Yeah. But it doesn't matter, because I'll tell you why. Because um, uh, listeners of this program are going to go to either, you know, to their independent bookseller or to wherever it is, pre-order right now. I mean, the thing <laughs> about doing it on Amazon is it pushes it up there and it becomes sort of a self-fulfilling prophecy. Uh, right. But um, so we have that link on uh, majority.fm. But we want to put a shout-out to the indies, too. In, in the, in definitely. Um, so uh, wherever you are, buy that book. Pre-order and, 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 it. Buy it. That, tell your friends. That, that's so sweet. And then, you know, this is the only place I really ever yield Facebook friends. Oh, that's right. Yes. We're going to put up, <laughs> let's put up uh, Guy's uh, Facebook page. I guess you've given up on Twitter. Is that it? No, I've started up again this week. Okay. So, hey, good job. Way to, way to really, uh, way, to, <laughs> way to lay the groundwork. Uh, it's uh, Guy Lawson. It's a bewildering too. world, man, for authors. It really is. All right. Well, uh, Guy, always a pleasure. Uh, can't wait to have you back on, and uh, we'll see you soon. 